Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to be talking about new research regarding black holes. And more specifically, the research that in some sense proves Stephen Hawking unfortunately wrong. While at the same time returning us back to the mystery of the so-called information paradox. Let's talk about this and welcome to What The Math. So before I start, I need to briefly explain to you what information paradox refers to. It's got something to do with black holes. It's the idea that was very thoroughly explored by Stephen Hawking, and in some sense, he was one of the few scientists that was very close to finally explaining it. But there was a problem, we didn't really have any experimental proof. Now what exactly is this idea? So first of all, when it comes to black holes, I think most of us already know that they kind of absorb all of the stuff, all of the matter, all of the light, and nothing can ever escape them. But where does this stuff go? And most importantly, what happens to the information of this stuff? What exactly do I mean by information? Well, for example, if we find a black hole that's slowly consuming the matter and various molecules and atoms of hydrogen and helium from this beautiful star right here, what happens to the atomic information of that hydrogen and helium? For example, things like the location of electrons when they got uh, consumed by the black hole and various other structural information. Because in physics, the idea is that you should be able to technically reconstruct anything as long as you have the information about this particular object. So in other words, if I were to run time backwards, and instead of the black hole absorbing all of this stuff, now all of this stuff is coming out of the black hole, this information has to be reconstructed. But it just so happens that because of the way we believe black holes are, all of this information seems to be sort of destroyed. We don't really know if it's actually stored anywhere. And this is where the information paradox begins. The current understanding is that it seems like the information um, just disappears and if we were to run the time backwards, this information would not be reconstructed in any way. So this is where Stephen Hawking tried to explain this by making a few assumptions and one of those assumptions was that maybe black holes have something he referred to as hair. These very unusual, very difficult to explain and very difficult to describe structures that were made out of um, possibly some subatomic particles, something he referred to as soft photons, and a lot of other things that are sort of stored on the surface of the black hole, very very close to the actual event horizon, and disappear slowly with the so-called Hawking radiation. In other words, um, he believed that maybe all of the black holes in the universe are in some sense unique. They store this information in this very unusual concept of hair. So he basically proposed a lot of ideas and a lot of scientific concepts to explain how this information can be stored. But in order for us to see if he's right or not, there is actually a way to test this by looking at the black hole collisions. Now in the last few years we were able to detect quite a lot of them, but this one right here, this is the original collision from 2015, really redefined our scientific understanding. So when two black holes collide, if these two black holes actually do have, I guess you can call it hair, if they're hairy black holes, if they have some sort of a way to store the information that fell into them, there would be a way for us to hear it. As they collide, they create the um, gravitational waves and these waves can then be converted into sound waves. If we look at them and if we actually try to hear them, it sort of sounds like this. Now this is a video that was made by LIGO Institute and here is my rough recreation of the sound. Essentially what you're hearing is two black holes slowly approaching each other and as they do the actual frequency increases because they get closer and closer and at some point you hear this chirp. But right here, right at the collision, as soon as the black holes collide, there's also a kind of an overtone. And this is something that we've been looking for because this overtone can really show us what's happening here. Now in order to understand why this is important, the best explanation I can give you is think of a typical bell. I'm sure all of you know what the bell sounds like, but you know that every bell is a little bit different. As a matter of fact, even if you take exactly the same looking bells, 
their atomic structure is going to be different. So when you ring them, their waves that they produce and the overtones they produce are going to be very complex and quite different from each other. And since the collision of two black holes produces a very similar frequency pattern as a bell ringing, we can actually analyze the overtones that are produced by these collisions and thus see if these two black holes are in some way unique, just like the bells here on Earth, or if they're all exactly the same. In other words, if they have hair and are all very unique in every single way, or if they're all identical, hairless things, objects, whatever you want to call them, that possess no identity and thus present no information on the surface. The first such paper that just came out studying this idea of no hair theorem and trying to prove it essentially analyzed the very slight overtones of this first collision. The scientists in this paper found a way to hear these overtones and were able to then discover that, unfortunately, the black hole overtone produced was basically hairless. In other words, there were no signs of any kind of unique identity in these black holes, or in other words, that all of them were hairless. And these black holes were identical in pretty much every major way, except for the three main properties. Their properties being mass, uh, momentum, and charge. Everything else about these black holes was pretty much identical, suggesting that the information is just not there. It's either lost completely, and thus the so-called information paradox is still a paradox, or it's stored in some other way we can't really imagine yet. Now, just for fun, I tried to create this ringing effect just to hear what it might sound like when these two black holes collide. And based on the information in the paper, right after the black holes collide, it probably sounds something like this. At least that's my best interpretation of the event. It's still very uncertain what really happens with black holes and what really happens inside of them, but also what happens to all of the material and all of the matter and of course information that is unfortunate enough to enter the black hole's event horizon. But by establishing this very specific technique that was used to study the overtones of these black holes, these scientists will be able to more accurately determine what's going on when these objects collide, but most importantly, we might be able to finally determine what happens to the information. Because without being able to preserve the information that falls into the black hole, it actually violates quite a lot of laws of physics. But one day we'll be able to explain all of this, and thanks to this paper, we now have a very good technique on how to measure the overtones of the collisions, and these overtones will provide us with a lot of information about what's really happening once these black holes collide. And although this doesn't necessarily prove Stephen Hawking completely wrong, because one of his ideas was that maybe the information is also released through the so-called Hawking radiation, which we believe does exist, and you can definitely learn more about this in one of the videos I made previously somewhere above my head, but this particular discovery or this particular paper definitely suggests to us that black holes don't really have the so-called hair. They're more or less identical, and if they do store information, it's stored in some other unusual way. Well, anyway, that's all I wanted to mention in this video. Check out the paper in the description below. And once we learn more about black holes and black hole collisions, we'll definitely talk about this in one of the future videos. Also, if you'd like to see how many different black hole and neutron star collisions we've discovered in the last few, well, actually, days and weeks, uh, because they've been happening pretty regularly, you can check out this website right here, the publicly available GRACE database. Here, Every single detection is almost instantly available to us, and you can even see what we think it is. Like, for example, right here, here's another black hole black hole collision, and there's a 99% chance that we've discovered another one in September of 2019. The link for this is in the description below, but for now, that's it. Come back tomorrow to learn something you may have not known before, and subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe even consider supporting this channel on Patreon because it does help me quite a lot. I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye-bye.